Hi, this is the third lecture and um, sorry for uh, a little bit of trouble. You guys didn't get this a uh, couple of days ago and uh, my voice was really down and uh, I think it's still down, but uh, we will try to get the best out of it. Uh, this is about the organizational environment. And uh, when we talk about organizational environment, we are largely talking about the influences that we have got on an organization. And organizations, again, in our context, are human service organizations, social work organizations, uh, but basically welfare is being, uh, um, you know, welfare is being churned out or welfare is being uh, given to different uh, communities that we talk about. So wherever you are, whether you are in a rural area or whether you are in an urban area, one of the basic things that you'll probably be thinking clearly about is uh, what is the organization that you are considering and what possibly are the final macro elements in that? Uh, you know, how does that organization connect itself to various uh, macro elements that we have. Um, I'm hoping that I can, um, yes, share screen, I'm going to do that. Right. Um, yes. So it's, uh, there are, of course, uh, yeah, to start with, uh, several of these uh, PowerPoint slides in this lecture. I think have been prepared by subsequent you know, several lecturers before. I couldn't get hold of their names. My sincere apologies. They are all faculty of the um, of the same university. My predecessors. Anyway, one of the things that I have done is uh, acknowledge uh, their resource as it is, and uh, I've also changed bits and pieces here and there. And the interpretation that I would be giving is uh, obviously entirely my own. So that is something that I wanted to say uh, right away in, um, in the beginning. Now it's important, as I said, how we understand each organization to be part of a huge macro system. And when we talk about macro system very clearly, we are talking about the political, the economic, the social climate in which most of these organizations you know, are uh, thought about. And we talk about political issues and other things. We are obviously talking in terms of uh, how the governments are formed. And uh, in a country like ours, generally where there is a two-party system, both parties go for elections, one of them gets elected. And there are, of course, there are a few other parties too, which do make uh, significant contribution on welfare issues and uh, probably on uh, you know generic welfare issues which are like climate environment and uh, you know greenhouse emissions and all those kind of things which are very largely broader societal and societal and environmental issues but uh, may not necessarily be at the grassroots affecting the real rock bottom welfare issues like child protection, domestic violence, uh, disability services, age care services, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, so we do have to understand that at the apex level, we do have considerations which keep coming uh, right. The political directions for welfare come from the political parties, their manifestos, their mandates that they will basically get through. So the environment, as Jones and May talk about, is very much everything which is outside the organization. And uh, now what's outside the organization? In fact, let's start with what's inside the organization. Average social worker, when they are asked to say where they are working, they might identify themselves with, oh, I work in the adolescent team, or I would work with the adults with disabilities, or I work with children in the um, early childhood services, or I might be working in the prison system, 
or I'm working with the children of prisoners. That's, that's the kind of orientation, that's the kind of introduction we generally tend to give. And we probably uh, stop at that. How that relates to the larger organization, what policies are there, what perspectives come through, and uh, where, where is the resources coming from, all those issues, generally called macro issues, somehow we don't seem to be, uh, I mean, we can relate to them, but most often we are probably not expected at the grassroots to think about them. But there are reasons why we don't think about them and there are reasons why we need to think about them. So we'll, we'll talk about those two. So uh, what does an organization look like from a Jones May perspective or from various other books that you might be looking at? It obviously talks about some sort of a network of services which are a, which you are able to relate them to the, when you teach them out, you will figure out that there are socio-political economic processes that have an influence over them. One of the things that they do talk about is once we know our environment, we can start thinking about how we can take a proactive approach to that environment, focusing on different interest groups, as well as the overall goal of the organization. Now let's, let's explain this in a rural organization, a community organization. A small community organization, which is serving a few things, let's say a community hub, where people come, just figure out a few things from the, you know, the neighborhood um, community worker, are interested in a few things, and they know uh, there are there are a few limitations on the hub. There are a few limitations on the services that can be available there. But then, as they start talking about emerging needs and about additional needs, it's quite possible that the hub and its workers might appreciate that need, might think in terms of putting up a program, might think in terms of uh, figuring out whether there could be resources somewhere. Let's say we suddenly discover in the community by an audit or by analysis or by scanning that there are a number of children who probably do not have any play services. So what do we do then? We then tend to think, what is it that we could do? How do we go about developing a service for them? It could be a recreational service. It could be sporting service. It could be you know, finding a little bit of respite for parents and taking the children for a little while and helping them to play. Whatever the service that we want to put up, we do a little bit of scanning of the community. We do a little bit of scanning of the resources within that environment. So moving away from your little place of work to going beyond the organization, to the outside boundaries of the organization, would be called the environment of the organization. In other words, it takes inspiration from external world, it is answerable to the external world, and at the same time, it can answer only on the basis of what resources it has got. Certainly where there are resource structure is little less, or resources are not enough, it would not be able to deal with those external newly arrived uh, issues and concerns. So it would need to then do some planning. It would need to go back to the drawing board to think about from where we can actually bring some more resources.
in their in their uh, definitions earlier johnson may also talk about organizational theory from a systems perspective and ecological theories a systems perspective i guess most of you do know what the systems perspective is it's about I mean, the whole world is made up of systems there are subsystems there are supra systems and everything else but if you do need uh, you know a very specific lecture on that do let me know i have got um, something that i can uh, add it on and uh, you know bring it up to you again there is the issue of ecological theories what do those theories talk about that environment human society and ecology human society has to be conceived in the overall ecology in which we live so there is interdependency dependency it is those kind of issues that ecological theories talk about ecological theories talk about uh, the ability with which we draw from the environment and how much we can draw from the environment and if we draw everything from the environment how will we replenish it is there you know is are there infinite resources in the environment that we can draw power from is there anything that we have as a duty of care to the environment these are some of the things that the ecological and systems theories in a way try to tell us or inform us when it comes down to organizations so the organizational life of of organizational life basically means how long an organization serves the needs of the people now if an organization came up as uh, in a community to and you know to develop some children services some children play services if children have grown up then certainly the organization may have two solutions it can either shuts up the children services because they're no longer children anymore or along with as they are growing up into adolescence and adults it begins a higher level of service which means it starts looking from children onwards and keeps going up so it takes up a model of a life span and it might expand so every time you expand it's a new agenda that comes up every time you expand it is uh, new resources that you need to find new ways and means that you need to find some creativity innovation will take place as we look at some of those uh, Uh, important uh, newly emerging ideas there is also the consideration on environment environmental uh, impacts on organization and these impacts come to you from the political economy political economy in very simplest word means the way the funding occurs in a way for most of the organizations of welfare it emphasizes in a way who funds it for what purposes what outcomes are expected and it's more or less like as it says uh, they call it a political nature of exchange with the environment what's the environment the environment of the need and the environment of the provision between provision and need you try to adjust and that's where political economy in a way comes through and what what theories influence some of our work in welfare in social work certainly to a large extent the marxian theories have influenced feminist theories have influenced certainly class critical theories abrational theories all of these things have influenced us in working out what is possibly a good plan a just plan that can give welfare to the people who are in need ozain and rose have suggested in 2013 contingency theory 
and uh, which, which is about, it, as it ex explains, is about organizational structures which become responsive to environmental demands. This is what we've been talking about. There's no static way by which you can deal with it. There are always new demands that come up. Even school, for instance, oh, it's been there for the last 30 years or 40 years. But what has changed is the students, is the children that keep changing every time. And also sometimes even the teachers also change, the management changes, all these things. So there are institutions which remain, the institutional context change, the institutional services change. And as we start going into your second assignment, we start seeing a nice story of how an institution or how an agency has changed from what it was once upon a time to where it is at this point of time. There is yet another theory, which is called a resource dependency theory. Again, in very simplistic words, it talks about how many, the, in, the resources are not infinite. You know, it's not a reservoir, like a well from where water is constantly being drawn. You've got to be thinking at some point of time, we need to do something. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I mean, in nature, for instance, uh, we draw water out and with this, of course, the replenishing actually takes place again, the water goes back in, into the whole, um, you know, into Mother Earth. So if an organization is dependent on the environment for resources every, every year, you need to make a plan to get a budget to get the wages, to get the salaries, to get to, to buy those consumables. All of that are dependent on resources. So there's an incremental way of looking at an organization development. There is, there is a possibility in such looking at, you know, in, in such a way of looking at organizations in an incremental way, you also have to add agenda as new agendas develop, you need to take them into cognizance and add them up along with the new budgets. The new institutional theory suggests rationalized practices and procedures need to be implemented. Now, why rationalization? Because there are no infinite resources. You need to tell people who come to us every now and then for, uh, look, I haven't, you know, I don't have money to pay for an electricity bill at this point of time. I run out of cash for something or the other. Then what does the church or any of those church related agencies tell them? It's fine, we are able to help you with the emergency funding this time, but probably you may not be able to come back to us at least for at least the next two or three months. You need to budget yourself and you need to work. So that's about rationalize practices. It's not that you know a client can go to a center and a B center and a C center and you know take up uh, you know money resources from different places. The, the centers, the agencies talk to each other. There are stakeholder meetings. There are common client meetings that we do talk about. The idea is to eliminate stagnation from one purpose. Idea is to eliminate also overindulgence, spoilage, spillages, and make sure we have an efficient, rationalized system, which obviously works for the clients and also works for us. So the importance of environmental analysis and what is an environmental analysis? An environmental analysis is all about going beyond the four walls of your organization. Just trying to see where does this organization fit in? How do the others think about this organization? What do people think about this organization and how do we also develop a stakeholder contact, stakeholder relationship with the organization. How do we go about doing that? 
organizational analysis of that nature, which is environmental analysis as well, helps us to build two things. One, it gives us an idea as to what's beyond our organization, where we can draw from. Second, while we are doing that, we also develop a good public relations strategy for the organization where the others will get to know what we are all about. You know, some of our international students try and tell us for the first time when they get into field placements, they tell us that, uh, oh, you have uh, services for uh, prisoners children. They haven't seen non-governmental organizations elsewhere in Asia or in the uh, Far East, where the prisoners' children are looked after. Because somebody who's in prison, mom and dad or whoever it is in prison, may be serving for a cause, for a reason. But the children at home or children elsewhere being looked after, they need care, they need contact. And they need services, which obviously will develop them uh, in a proper environment. So that's sort of a revelation for them. In, 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 in many other countries, there are prison services, but probably there are no services for specifically prisoners' children. Maybe the children's services in their country must have taken all of them in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger umbrella, but we are a little more specific. So it's fascinating for us to contextualize that a social worker might have a contact with the mother in the prison, might also have a contact with the child who is at home, but belonging to this mother. So there is there's not only a contact, there is a service philosophy, a direction that we have got. So in the environmental, in the, all of these things have come about as a result of what? They have come about as a result of environmental analysis. To see the special distinctive service that might be required for the child of a prisoner, rather than just put him under child protection. You couldn't, because this is not a child who's been abused or neglected. But although there could be neglect, there could be alienation, there could be stigmatization. So the range of services for a child who, is, who belongs to a prisoner are different from a child who needs child protection services. So you see, it's the environmental analysis that makes the difference in terms of how you perceive a particular problem how you see and uh, how much of generalization you can use and how much more uh, objectivity you need to bring or what I would call particularization that you might have to bring, bring about when you are trying to understand these organizations. Right, so how do we do that? Uh, how is environmental analysis relevant to the role of a case manager in aged care, community care, organizations such as OzCare or Blue Care? Now, what environmental analysis would you be doing if you are looking at an aged care situation? Okay, these are people who are living in nursing homes. They have visitors. In addition to visitors, how do I increase their community contact? How do I go about talking to strange commercial stakeholders from whom we, might be, we may be purchasing our groceries and everything else to involve, to be involved in their lives, to come around and do something? How do I go about doing getting a musical group to perform in an aged care place? How do I get some voluntary people who are just happy 
to come and listen to these old, uh, you know, to the narratives, old narratives of some of the inmates. And how do I ensure that uh, each one could even be befriended? I know we've got all restrictions. We have got blue clear card and uh, you know, we have to get the adult disability card and uh, police clearance and everything. That's all fine. Statutorily, all those things taken care of, ticked off, you would be doing in your environment and analysis. Environment and analysis is always towards a purpose. The purpose to increase services, context, or to build again a new service. Why is environment and knowledge central to the organization, workers and service users? If you don't give them that knowledge, if you don't explain how this fits into the larger society, people will, 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 have, will have an outlook like a, just a, one single frog in a well. It just thinks that the well is the world. There are people who make those comments. I don't know anything beyond my nursing home. They're very proud of that. From one perspective, yes, you do carry that pride. You do not know anything more than the nursing home. But you're doing great. You're doing efficiently. That's wonderful. We are very happy to hear about that. But it is essential for you to know how does that nursing home fit in to the larger society? When do people come into nursing home? When do people go out of nursing home to more, you know, uh, more, more um, comprehensive nursing homes or infirmaries and, uh, you know, things like that? When or uh, one stage before, how many people are interested possibly in looking at the pension accommodations of their own choice? And people down, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, downsize their uh, family homes and everything else because they, once they are retired and then their age doesn't allow them to have a four bedroom home, go around lawns and everything else, they might just want to downsize. So all of that is part of your environmental analysis and it's what is important. So how will that knowledge help us? Certainly the knowledge will help us to see where the gaps are. The knowledge will help us to see how many people probably can achieve their goals. Think of COVID-19, the last 18 months, two years almost. I know very few, you know, there have been challenges servicing, servicing aged care industry. Lots of adults, parents, grandparents, 65 and above were told, look, if you don't need to go, don't go. Social distancing came up. Lots and lots of people evolved themselves into the confines of their own homes. As a result, what happened? As a result, probably and possibly, new problems would emerge. Alienation, isolation, anomie inability to understand and move on. All these things are very, very important in a way for us to look at. So I think the environmental analysis is a very, a very important skill that we would need to have as social workers. Right. Um, there are about, uh, once again, from Jones and May, they talk about four approaches to conceptualizing the organizational environment. So this is a little more structured now. They talk about a task environment. They talk about a general environment. And they also talk about in some environmental characteristics. And uh, in here, 
Right. That's, that was missing. It's good. I, I managed to catch that. It's the organization arena, C figure 41, which is probably from the book. Now, locality, where we are, it's called the geographical entity or geographical identity, wherever the organization is. Super organization, which is part of the major organization, Anglicare, is part of the overarching Angli, Anglican church body. You will find one whose headquarters could be in Queensland. Then there could be a regional headquarters somewhere in Rocky, anywhere else. Then the sector that it serves. What is it it doesn't serve? Probably child protection, aged care, disabilities, mental health, every other area. And in those areas, there are concerns that they pick up. There are goals that they express and they work through. Industry groups. What is industry groups? Industry groups, social workers, psychologists, mental health practitioners, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, recreational therapists, artists. When in the aged care area, home care area, plumbers, cleaners, electricians, builders, a whole lot of people are required in each of those industries. So all of them, when you go within the aged care industry, again, there are others who belong to different industries. So those who are in aged care industry, right from cleaners to social workers, to managers, to psychiatrists, everybody else can come through. Network. Now networks are generally meaningful stakeholder kind of groupings that we make with an intention to use them as and when we can. What would be the task environment for people? And how do the task environment, task environment is the day-to-day -day work. How many clients do I have? How many workers do I have as a team leader? How many clients they look after? How many homes do they look after? What happens in these homes? As a support coordinator, how many other support workers do I have? What's their rosters like? Where do they go? What's happening? What's the productivity? Are there any complaints? And how is that mechanism working? Are there any of their own personal grievances? And how are we tackling them? So all these become very, very uh, important in the task environment when we look at it. And of course, we already started with the general environment. We talked about the general environment being the social, economic, political. We didn't talk about legal and technological. Legal, yes. In any country, first we serve the citizens, then we serve others who might be temporary residents. COVID-19 was a classic exemplar in all societies where nationalism became very, very important over anybody else who is probably, you know, second citizen or temporary resident. Many, many people were told if you don't have ways and means to live by, you better pack up and go when the planes were there. Whether it's fair or not fair is a different discussion. From an economist perspective, it's a fair call when I don't have resources to take care of my own country, what am I going to take care of others? That's how some people feel. The others might feel, look, these guys came here and they're paying their income tax in this country. It's not fair for us to just disown them. They'll never come back. True, some of those things we have to wear. It's the same issue with your overseas university students. We still have many, many issues with COVID-19, the virus, the vaccine, the civil aviation commencement and everything else. In an unclear environment, we can take some risks. We can't take, we can't, we can take some risks, but we can't risk the citizens 
life. So therefore, well, universities might be asking, oh, we need to get the students back because of revenue. The society might be wanting to get all these international students also back because of the economic spending that they do within the country. We couldn't do that unless we feel we can keep the citizens safe so that there is an inherent expectation in the social, economic, political climate that we legally look look after our citizens first and then somebody else later. I understand from a social work perspective, human rights perspective, people will always talk about still, but still, you know, those kind of terminologies come up, yes. But we need to be thinking in terms of, or the governments should think in terms of what's expedient for them, what they can do and what they can't do. Second thing again, it is not just the government that has to do. What is the government? The government is only a little bit. Everything else is in, what else is, you know, water is not owned by the government. Many resources are not owned by the government. They're all being privately organized. So therefore, we need to look at how some of these things are impacting on us. I'm quite sure somewhere in other lectures you come through liberalism, you come through new managerialism and various other things. We'll be addressing that as well because human services are impacted by those things. So environmental factors. Uh, they say that in the literature of human service management, we deal with this kind of dichotomy, dichotomies or, you know, oppos oppositional areas of practice, uniformity in service provision, diversity in service provision. What does that mean? Uniformity means one size fits all. Diversity would mean, no, each one according to his needs. Certainty, uncertainty, not sure. It's like the, at this point of time, the little bit of money back that was given to people who are unemployed as a result of COVID-19 or lost their employment for a few months, there were some services. But we can't go on on that for a long time. Tourism, for instance, is worsely hit. Probably there are a few incentives here and there, but it all comes down to sustainability of certain things. One of the things which is not sustainable is long-term issues connected with provisions of welfare. At some point of time, we always have the doubt that some of these shops, some of these front offices have to say, sorry, government is no longer funding us. We got to think about something. Richness and paucity. Back again, those words mean a lot. Quality of service, modicum of service, a mean, a mean, a, a, a golden mean, a level of service that is okay. Does the government services have everything? The government hospitals have everything? Yes, they do. But there are wait lists. There's a big way by which the wait lists are managed. The complex cases come up first. Simple things don't get immediate attention. Go to an emergency in a hospital. For you, it is your emergency. For you, it is your pain. Just in front of you, an accident victim comes in. There he goes. Somebody else comes in. There he goes. So life-saving versus life-sustaining. So there are various ways by which you need to understand the human services discourse. Human services discourse goes beyond social work. It enters allied health, it enters school education, it enters everything that you would otherwise would probably not think is human services. Sometimes we think we're just cogs in the wheel, but that's okay. 
a cog in the wheel is equally important because it has a purpose, a deliberate purpose. But what probably we need to do is increase our ability to speak about our contribution to the wheel itself, to the cycle itself. That's how I would see the concept. Right. So with reference to the aged care, community care, if we were to map out its environment, which I think I did, what's the organization in arena? What's the task environment? What's the general environment? What are the environmental characteristics? Organizational arena, if it is an aged care nursing home, that's it. You've got consumers there. Some call them patients before. Some call them clients. There's a routine system. There's a roster system. There's a breakfast time. There's a lunch time. There's a TV time. There's a book reading time. And there may be an exercise time, depending upon whatever it is. Each one has a carer would have a, a few cares, 10 or 15 of them to look after. They do a routine job. So the organizational arena is about routine functions. The task environment for each person is different. The doctor in the morning might make a run. The nurse along with him takes a run of the ward, if it is a ward or a room or whatever it is. The doctor might come back again if there is an emergency or somebody is not too well, the nurse might come back. The general environment is the environment in which the, the, overall, the, the overall community in which it is, it is around. Where is it serving? What's the catchment area? If it is 100 miles away from Brisbane, will people be willing to go? Maybe yes, if that's the only aged care nursing home. So we do establish them in suburbs. In different suburbs, there are many that are established based on the needs. Some are established based on the community, the Italian community, the Greek community, the Chinese community. I don't know who else has got the Russian community. But certainly there are those which are established around the language, the culture, they establish their own. So ethnic diversity is one of those things that comes up in this particular area. So how would this knowledge of environmental scan be helpful to us in an aged care kind of a organization? It talks about how many more people want to come into the care, What's the numbers that are waitlisted? What are the types of care people are asking for? Do we need to expand? Are we becoming specialists? Are more cancer patients coming in? Is there an oncological service that needs to be added here? Are there more and more people with disabilities getting attracted to our nursing home? And why so? Is that because we built up a reputation that we have been friendly to people with disabilities? Or is it word of mouth from where it has gone in? So the environmental scan becomes important for us. Our reputation becomes important for us. Who brings up this reputation? Reputation is by the carers. Reputation is by the workers who work at the grassroots. So these are some of the things which become very, very important for us to understand. What are some possible changes in the environment that the organization needs to be aware and prepare itself for? Yes, the demographics of the area, the demographics of the suburb, the demographics of the city, of the state. One thing is certain, if I live in Brisbane, no, I mean, an aged care institution, let's say in Chermside somewhere, can't say, hey, southerners can't come to the northern area. 
I can say I'll travel. Because once I travel, I'm seeking accommodation. So it can be anywhere. The state might also say, if you're looking for aged care and if we have to place you, we'll place you anywhere. Suppose let's assume in Canberra, there are more places than in Sydney. Reluctantly, at some point of time, we may have to transfer the numbers that are coming in Sydney to Canberra. So these are some of those things that we will have to be looking at when we are considering the environment and environmental scan. Then, of course, the next question, of course, is how might this knowledge influence your work in this organization or its environment? Any organization that you work, it's important for you to see the macro connection. How is this related right to the top? I used to, I used to ask this question. Does your prime minister know about this? And people will say, why would prime minister know about this? Not necessarily, that's exactly the same kind of a thing. Are we able to go right to the top and connect somewhere if we were to connect it? So how much macro can we go? Very local realities. So we work locality development, but we think about community. Community becomes larger community and a larger regional community. A larger regional community is part of the overarching state community and the state community is in a way part and parcel of the entire country. So it is those kind of aspects which, which we need to be very much aware of and we hope we will move on. So micro level, back to our own grassroots. We gather information about the clients. We gather information as to what their needs are. I know I don't like the word marketing, but then it's, it's almost becoming marketing. We look for services. We, 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 we use public relations, resource mobilization. We do the lobbying. We talk to politicians. We talk to MLAs, members of legislative councils, our parliamentarians. Yes, we do, do take sometimes co-option and sometimes disruptive social work. Disruptive social work is not a bad sign. You, know, you just go in and find out, you know, what's the, I always sometimes think, hey, disruption can also be a wonderful strength-based way of working because you're inside. You know what things are available and work through it's not a slimy way of doing things, but making your managers aware that something else is also a part of our mandate. They are, they, they are, they are, they're forgetting things, making, making things obvious to people. Hey, if you don't do this, something else will happen. I think that's a very important thing to try all kinds of tactics, although in the modern world, advocacy is becoming uh, uh, and not a very popular thing for people to use because uh, the more you advocate, there's a misunderstanding. Advocacy is whinging. It's unfortunate. Social workers don't whinge for themselves. Social workers obviously whinge or advocate for the clients. I think all of that is coming back to the dollar size coming, coming down. So therefore, uh, we have more and more or less, uh, less tolerance towards advocacy. Having said that, so the environmental changes also need to be seen, not as constraints, but as opportunities. And then, of course, a lot of people know what the SWOT analysis is, and there are various ways by which you can do that common sense thing, sense, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It helps you to think about and reinventing your own role. I think that's a, a fairly good summary about environment. And uh, 
at the micro level, it also, there are a few definitions that Usain talks about, introduces the concept of learning organization. The learning organization is always open to things. Always in a learning, what is a learner? A learner is open to new things. It is uh, a transformational organization. It is a strength-based organization. It's an organization that does consider that there will be opportunities and that they need to be thinking about. So transformation can come about as a result of a deliberate plan and a sustained effort of the workers relating themselves to the clients, relating their stories to the teams, the team managers listening to them, taking them upwards to their managers, managers listening to their team managers or team leaders and taking them further up to the regionals. So there's a client-centeredness which permeates from the grassroots up above. I'm quite sure we can deal with the environment and provide a very good analysis for ourselves of what is required at the grassroots and how we can transform the grassroots. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this piece of uh, lesson was, uh, in this, this particular lecture was useful and uh, hopefully uh, next week, I'll try to put up the next lecture uh, much in advance and uh, thank you very much, bye.